All right. I'll go ahead and call to order this regular city council virtual meeting for Monday, May 11th, 2020. And if we could all say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge the allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. All right, Barb, would you call the roll, please? Roland. Here. Bizzard. Bellinger. Here. Weiss. Here. Rines. Here. Gilroy. Here. Smith. Here. All right. Thank you, Barb. And now I'm looking for an approval of the agenda for this evening's meeting, unless there's changes that need to be made. This meeting is being recorded. Motion to approve the agenda as written. Weiss. Thank you. Support. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Noah. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Uh, moving along. I don't think we have any audience that have tuned in. I do not see any audience at this time. This would be a, a opportunity for audience participation. Uh, we'll move along to council meeting minutes for April 13th, 2020. Motion to approve the minutes is written, Weiss. Thank you. Second, Rhines. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Uh, moving right along. No, I believe you were able to review accounts payable for this evening. Yes, I did. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve check 12A dated 430 of 2020 and check four or check 73125 dated 416 2020 through check 53169 dated 51 of 2020 and i did have a couple questions prior to the um, meeting and i talked to those and just for um Things. One was on the election testing, which was check um, 73127, and that was for election testing. And I got the explanation that was a uh, required um, fee uh, to test all our election equipment. And then there was a second check of 73128, um, and it was for a drug testing and screening, and it was a requirement for the uh, licensing of one of our DPW workers. They have to take that test. So Corey answered all those questions. And uh, does anybody have any other questions relating to any of other of the check items? I I have a question on check 73165, the Osterly Electric check. It says it's here for electric hookups for DPW fuel tanks. Um, that was for $1,600, correct? Yes. Is that, are we starting to keep our, our fuel on site now or what is, uh, I will defer to Corey on that one or if Scott is available. Sure. I can address that for Dan. Um, so the Pacific pride that is on the South end of town, um, has gone through the process of closing. That was traditionally where we got our diesel fuel as well as our gasoline. And so in a pinch to create a solution for that, um, we were able to get tanks installed uh, at no cost for the tanks, uh, but we had to have electric hookup to run the pumps. So those are on site on the DPW um, starting about a month ago, I think it's been, um, in place of that Pacific Pride uh, solution and going out of business. Does that change? Um, do, do we hit incur any larger insurance costs because of now having those fuel holding tanks on site? And what about charges for delivery for the fuel? How much are, are we going to be seeing a large increase in cost? 
for this? No, we don't anticipate that. Um, part of the deal with, I think it's Randy's Trucking out of Fowlerville, um, they bring the fuel and basically we're charged the cost of fuel. There's not a, a tipping fee or a truck fee. Um, as for insurance, that was not part of our analysis uh, as far as making that decision. So I, I'd have to follow up on that with you, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Jeff White says his hand raised. Okay. Hey, um, we use Pacific Pride at work, uh, both my current work and former work. And we could also use Speedway stations. So I don't know if they it's possible to use a Speedway downtown. I, I mean, I guess it's kind of late in the bit late in the game after the tanks were installed, but uh, just put that out there for cost savings in the future. Corey, I guess my question also would be, did we have to obtain any um, specific you froze up, Tammy. It, Tammy froze up for me. I heard, okay. did we have to obtain any specific? That was all I heard. Specific certification for having fuel on site? No. Okay. And is that covered in our insurance coverage that we can have fuel on site? Uh, that was similar to Dan's question, if our insurance was going to go up. Um and so I'd have to look, look at that again. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other questions regarding accounts payable? That was a great question, Dan. If not, I had a motion on the floor. Okay. All right. I'm looking for support of that motion. Second, Rhines. Thank you. Barb, will you call the roll for the accounts payable, please? Bellinger. Yes. Weiss. Yes. Rhines. Yes. Gilroy. Yes. Smith. Yes. Roland. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one action item before us this evening, and that is to set the budget public hearing for the 2020-2021 fiscal year budget. And we're looking at setting that public hearing for May 26th at 7.05 p.m. Uh, Corey? Would you like to jump in at this point? Uh, yeah, this is just a simple follow-up from our budget work session. This formalizes the setting of the public hearing, uh, which we are required to uh, host in accordance with our charter. And so this is simply a request for council to set that public hearing. Uh, in the memo, we noted that the executive order allowing these meetings uh, to happen digitally um, was extended to June 30th. And so... Uh, we will. We are planning that this will be held uh, as part of a Zoom council meeting on Tuesday, May 26th, uh, which is on a Tuesday because Memorial Day is on Monday, May 25th. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Corey regarding this, or uh, would somebody like to make a motion uh, to set this uh, hearing date? I'll make a motion, uh, Smith. Uh, motion to set public hearing for the 2020-2021 fiscal year budget for Tuesday, May 26, 2020 at 7.05 p.m. Thank you, Gene. Second, Weiss. Thank you, Weiss. Uh, Barb, if there's no further discussion or any other questions, will you call the roll, please? Bellinger. Yes. Weiss. Yes. Rhines. Yes. Gilroy. Yes. Roland. Yes. Smith. Yes. Thank you, Barb. All right, that concludes the action items for this evening. And now we're going to go into a discussion item, which is regarding community reopening. And I do apologize for not being available for the budget meeting. I did have a follow up discussion with Corey uh, regarding um, some uh, questions regarding what could we do as a municipality to maybe help um, our businesses reopen downtown. And so I'm going to go ahead and defer to Corey uh, regarding the memo that was included in the packet. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So the, the memo is basically a launching point for this discussion 
uh, based on the conversations we had a week ago, Monday. And so the memo is brief on the legal aspect. I did chat with Tim Perrone uh, on the Tuesday after the meeting to go over the questions that council was raising. And Tim is prepared to uh, give his opinion as well as counsel and answer questions on this topic. Um, and so I, I guess at this point, I would defer to Tim uh, to give us an overview of his thoughts as well as to uh, perhaps answer any other questions uh, or comments that council has. Sure. Thank you, Corey. Tim. Thank you, uh, Mayor. As I understand, the underpinnings of this discussion were with regard to potential revenue, revenue losses as a consequence of businesses being closed. I think the city manager has explained the indirect uh, relationship between local businesses and your state revenue sharing to the point where there really isn't a one-to-one -one relationship with regard to local businesses being open. We all know that uh, these businesses and basically all of us are under the uh, governor's executive order. The most recent one that deals with this is number 77 that extends the state of emergency and state of disaster through May 28th of this year. But that is subject to modification and further extension uh, before the expiration date, depending on conditions closer to that date. <clears throat> The main thing that we're aware of is that in-person dining at restaurants is banned, as well as gatherings of crowds of people at theaters and gyms and general retail businesses are suspended. Now, there are some exceptions, but there are some restrictions. There are criminal sanctions because these executive orders have the force of law. And our firm's advice has been that the executive order is effective through May 28th, unless it's overturned by a court order. And there are several court challenges to the governor's authority under these orders. And I'm happy to go into great detail on those if you want, but in general, the governor's authority is based on two statutes, uh, the emergency powers to the governor act from 1945 which does not contain a time limit on its effectiveness, uh, but it is intended for local situations like civil unrest or riots. The governor could impose a curfew. There's no reference to epidemics in the 1945 act. There's the 1976 Emergency Management Act that allows the governor broad powers with regard to certain situations, including an epidemic However, the exercise of those powers terminates after 28 days unless the legislature extends it. And uh, the legislature did extend an original order, but only through the end of April, when the governor requested a further extension, the, the legislature did not provide that extension. But the governor then purported to and the originally declared states of emergency and disaster, and then turned around immediately and declared new states of emergency and disaster. And that's why that justified extending the current situation through May 28th. Now, there are some legal challenges to that extension of the order and uh, there are several lawsuits. One is brought by uh, the Michigan legislature, one brought by a U.S. representative. There's another case brought by five Detroit businesses. And the, these cases are brought variably in the Michigan Court of Claims, which is where you sue the state government in state court. And some of them are filed in federal courts. Now, one of the first cases that was raised in the Court of Claims last month denied injunctive relief despite acknowledging the infringement of civil liberties because there was only a temporary harm to civil rights. Well, that was before the latest extension and the subsequent arguments that can be raised that the lack of the governor's authority 
to extend it under the 1976 Act. Now, the, uh, the legislature's lawsuit is more interesting because they go directly at the purposes of the two acts upon which the governor relies and says that she's improperly interpreting the scope of her authority under the act such that uh, it's not reasonable what she's done, that she's gone beyond what authority the legislature granted her in those acts. But then secondarily, they're saying if by some interpretation, the governor is acting in accordance with the powers granted in those acts, well, those acts purport to grant her vast legislative powers which would be an unconstitutional delegation and the statutes themselves should be struck down as unconstitutional. So essentially the legislature is arguing that one of the laws passed by the legislature is unconstitutional. And over the weekend, some legal experts have looked at it and three out of four have said that the governor should prevail in these cases based on reasonableness of interpretation, the technical reading, the fact that the earlier law has no time limit, and that regardless of all of that, there's still the ability to impose health regulations for uh, an epidemic. Well, that's all fine and good. Um, so it comes down to the governor's statutory authority is questionable. And there's been even some uh, developments even today I think we're aware of uh, some businesses that are opening in defiance of the order. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them uh, was a barber shop in Owasso in Shiawassee County. Uh, they kept giving him uh, citations to take him to court for that. Apparently he went to court and defended and at least got some type of injunctive or temporary restraining order to allow him to remain open. And that's probably less a matter of the legality of the situation and more of the politics of a local jurisdiction. The Shiawassee Sheriff himself has declared openly he's not going to enforce the executive orders. So if a business opens in defiance of it, he's not gonna take any action. Same thing with several other sheriffs throughout Michigan, although not all, but that doesn't mean that a local police department or the state police could not enforce or even the local health department if the matter was subject to a health order by the health officer, particularly with regard to restaurants, which are licensed by the health department. When it comes down to the city council, city council did not close these businesses. So the city council isn't really in the position to reopen those businesses. Right. Those businesses closed voluntarily in compliance with the executive order. And while that order is in place, they would reopen at their own peril. Now what the city council can do is express their political opposition to the recent extension of the executive orders. They could disagree that the governor has the lawful authority to do that, but it would be more in the nature of a symbolic resolution and wouldn't really have the force of law to overcome the legality or at least the, the patent legality of the governor's order. What the city council can do though is control your own aspects. Um, you could open the city parks and allow the use of park equipment Unlike a county board of commissioners, which has no control over a county sheriff, can't tell the sheriff what to do, the city council can direct the police department of the city what to do with regard to a policy of non-enforcement of the executive order's restrictions on business. And I wouldn't have any legal objection to the city council directing the police chief not to take strict enforcement action against perceived violations of the executive order. Although again, other agencies could take such enforcement action and the city council cannot prevent that from happening. 
and the city council's permission for a business to reopen would not be a defense against an enforcement action and certainly would not be any defense at all against a valid public health order, particularly with regard to a restaurant or other gathering of people, which then leads to the city council's option to take its own legal action, a legal challenge to the validity of the executive orders or even the health orders as being beyond the legal authority or being unreasonable in scope, that would likely require some type of expert opinion to counter the health officer if you're going that route. Now, I don't recommend that the city council take direct legal challenge to the orders because there's already plenty of cases doing that. They're very well researched. They're very well presented. But again, it's kind of up in the air. Another problem and issue that's been arising just over the weekend and today is that there are law firms around the state that are sending messages to city attorneys and prosecutors telling them that enforcement of the executive orders uh, with regard to the challenged ability of the governor to do them at this time is subjects the, the municipalities to potential liability for things like malicious prosecution and yep. unlawful confinement and things like that. Uh, maybe even assault and battery if they if they make an arrest, for instance. I think that's done to kind of scare some people or it's really to lend confusion to the situation as though there's not enough confusion. And beyond the law firms that are threatening local jurisdictions with liability, there are groups of citizens, sometimes we refer to them as sovereign citizens, who are claiming that they're, they have rights, which everybody knows we have rights, but they're asserting them in a certain way, a certain manner, threatening city managers around the state uh, with, uh, again, with liability for enforcing it, declaring that they are not going to comply and daring city officials to take action, uh, in, imposing questions on the uh, city management, demanding answers uh, of which there's no legal obligation to respond. And again, that with the law firms challenging and raising the issue, it lends confusion to the issue and it's something that we can do without. When there is a dispute between a legislative branch and the executive branch of government, we turn to the third branch of government. We look to the courts to resolve that. And so while the matters are pending in court, the best advice would be to comply with the orders as best you can. Although when I look at them, they're rather ambiguous and broadly worded to the point where you could probably justify doing certain things and arguing that they fall within the allowable restrictions in the orders and then defy somebody to show you that that interpretation is not justified. Um, and then of course, it comes down to enforcement. Who would determine that you're not in compliance and then what would they do about it? So for instance, in the city, if a local business opened up, would somebody really know about it? Would it come to the attention and would it be enforced? Could they argue that they fall within one of the exceptions for the restrictions or that they're following the restrictions to their best interpretation and with the confusion out there that they're just acting in good faith and they shouldn't be held liable for a criminal violation of something that is truly vague. And it is a, uh, a valid defense and a constitutional challenge to say that a regulation is void for vagueness, that reasonable people cannot understand what's allowed and what isn't. And it goes so far as to impinge on people's constitutional freedoms. The bottom line, city council can't really do a whole lot about 
opening up businesses that are closed. You can indicate that the city government is not going to stand in the way of people and that if they do open, good for them, but they're acting at their own peril. Perhaps they will get a good judge like in Shiawassee that's gonna stand up for the local people. Maybe we'll get a decision from the Court of Claims uh, before May 28th. Maybe the, even if the uh, legislature prevails in the litigation, they will turn around and enact legislation that codifies a lot of the provisions in the executive order. This doesn't mean this can't happen. They're just arguing that the, it's not a matter of what can happen. It's a matter of who gets to do it. So that's the main uh, challenge that we're, we're seeing here. And it's just kind of a wait and see, and everybody's just gotta be patient. And I know we've been saying that for two months now. <laughs> Thank you all for your patience and letting me talk this long. Absolutely, Tim. And I think probably we're all in agreement that we want to see our businesses downtown throughout the whole, you know, uh, district reopen, but we certainly don't want anybody to jeopardize their livelihood that's already compromised. And I applaud the, the barber in Owasso for being that bold and taking a stand. Um, but, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to see any of our uh, downtown businesses like you said, um, do it at their own risk. And, uh, you know, that's my, that's my feelings on it. Holly, who do we have that has questions for Tim? Jeff Rowland has his hand raised. Okay, Jeff. Thanks, Tammy and uh, Barb. And wow, Tim, that was awesome. Um, synopsis. I mean, re really the original question, um, you know, that I had was, you know, depending upon the state, you know, as you know, I mean, health and welfare seems to be a bit of a bottom up authority scenario. And so um, certain cities and certain states have um, authority to uh, go further um, than a governor's executive order or uh, potentially contradicted if they feel like their locality is uh, better suited um, than the state as a whole. So if I'm properly understanding um, your delivery there that Williamston would not be in a scenario to um, just simply enact our own uh, rule order um, to uh, reopen um, the town on any level, phase, whatever. Is that that's correct, right? Yes. What you were what you were referring to was health, safety, and welfare concerns, and those are the police powers of a governmental entity and the state has the police powers, the, the city as a home rule city has police powers. But when the state uh, exercises police powers, they take preemption over the city and this, uh, unless there is an ability of the city to do something different. But in this case, the governor's orders preempt anything at the local level. And to the extent the city council could act it would only be to do something even more strict than what the governor is allowing, not right. more lenient. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, and th thank you again for you know that that detailed research and what have you. I, I was just coming from a place of looking ahead that we hit June one, and you know we're we're around the community talking to people, and um, you know they're, they're wondering what they can and cannot do to uh, at least be able to give them even a limited amount of advice on, you know, any way in which they can proceed, uh, be it at their own risk or not. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and, and also if we maybe in the future want to explore some ambiguities um, to, you know, hair salons, barbershops, my dog looks like a disaster. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how there can be overnight boarding of a dog, but you can't have a dog groomed. So there's, some weirdness going on there in Cornell Road as well with uh, that doggy daycare. But in any event, I appreciate that, uh, Tim, and, and um, that, that's that's all I had, Tammy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Holly, anybody else with hands up? Uh, no, I do not see anybody. Oh, Gene. Oh. Gene put his actual hand up. Oh. <laughs> I put my, <laughs> my physical hand up. Thank um, you, Gene. So, Go ahead. So to understand this, 
uh, and Tim, correct me if I misunderstood something, but you're saying if we want to reopen our parks, if we want to direct our police department to not be overhanded in enforcement and those type of things towards businesses that chose to on their own open up and not face their own financial disaster any further than what's been imposed upon them, uh, then that would be something that our city council would have the authority to do um, based on what you're saying. Is that? Okay. Let me address first the parks. Um, parks are allowed to be open. I believe uh, maybe some state parks or even national parks will be open, but you are in control of the parks. You're, you can allow that. People who are, go out in public are still supposed to um, practice social distancing. And that shouldn't be an issue. I know that you may have taped off the uh, play equipment. It's a matter of, of choice, I think, for the city to allow that. With regard to an enforcement policy, that is up to the city council because uh, enforcement at the local level would be through the police department and the police in many cases inherently have discretion as to whether or not to enforce a particular law or executive order as a matter of discretion. And city council could indicate that we don't want tickets written for this. Maybe somebody could be warned that if there's a gathering of people, if there's a, a failure of social distancing, or if a suspended business purports to open, they could be warned that they could be found in violation, although the city government itself wouldn't be the ones to do the enforcement on that. And getting back to the, uh, the example of the barber shop, it's pretty clear that barber shops and beauty salons are not allowed to open because of the inherent closeness that has to be done for those. And even if a guy can af af avoid a criminal prosecution or get some type of relief to allow him to remain open in defiance of the order, the state still has control over his license, a barber license or cosmetology license. And that action would take place separately and distinctly from a court so that the local uh, judiciary wouldn't be there to protect him in that, in that light. And so they, the state and the governor's order has threatened business licenses to the extent they have one. And a, and a restaurant might have a liquor license, for instance. And if the state takes that away, uh, the local judges aren't going to be much help, at least initially, because that's all done through an administrative process. So that comes down to the business's choice, acting at their own peril, maybe not having much to fear from city government, city police, but they do potentially have to answer to the state police, the county prosecutor, county health department, state health department. I'm, I'm just picturing a business owner that has pretty much lost everything they've invested at this point and is getting ready for complete ruin. And if they chose to open up on their own, I mean, to, to them, they could open up and chance losing their license or stay closed and be guaranteed to lose everything. Um, I guess I would like to explore the city council making a resolution to just not have a hand in that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and ask, I'd like to go ahead and ask chief, have we had any complaints come into the, to the uh, department with regard to maybe businesses that shouldn't be open? Have you had any calls? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can, yes. Chief. Hi chief. I have had a few uh, complaints and I have dealt with them personally. Uh, I'm not going to get specific in an open public meeting, but I have dealt with them. Um, I would, my recommendation is that you allow us the, the discretion that I allow my officers, for example, some people speed, they don't get caught. Some people speed and do get caught. They don't get a ticket and some people do. 
And I see this in the same fashion. Our, our department has a reasonable approach. Uh, all the things that Tim pointed out with all the ambiguities to this. And so when the, the complaints I dealt with, I took it to the business and said, here's the allegation. And they dealt with it. Okay. And so not given any written um, notification and we have not done any citation. I would not like to see council take that discretion away from the officers. I clearly hear the direction you're you're wanting. That's the direction we we currently are doing, not only on this, but on a lot of other complaints, whether it's barking dogs. Uh, that's the latest thing that's been hitting the internet. And um, the truth of the matter is, in the 10 years I've been here, we've never written a citation, but that got quite a bit of attention. And, and so I see this in the same type of fashion that uh, my suggestion is you don't take our officer's discretion and and what you are talking is the way it has been. And it's all complaint driven. Thank you, Chief. Uh, what's the group's feeling on um, letting DPW reopen the parks? That could be a little bit of a bright spot in the community. I mean, the, new, the nice weather is coming up. I know that um, Farmer's Market is getting ready to open. So what's our consensus on uh, reopening our parks? 100% support. I'll support it. Agree. I support it. Well, in our farmers right. markets carved out is something that people can do anyways. Uh, yes, it is. And I haven't had an opportunity to talk with Tom Carey, but um, I know they are still looking at the 17th for their opening uh, Sunday. And so my goal is to touch base with him this week and just um, I'm sure that they've got a plan. I'm sure there's going to be some hiccups that first day. Um, so I'm looking forward to it and I'm keeping my fingers crossed for them. But um, I don't know if we need to take actual action, um, Corey, to have DPW reopen those parks. But I'd like to see that happen. Uh, that's been noted. So just as a point of clarification, we never closed the parks. We did. Uh, close down the playground equipment and right. basketball courts, but in general, parks have been open to the public. Um, and really that that decision stemmed from a couple of things. Uh, one of the key ones is that when this first started happening, uh, there was some guidance from both our Ingham County Health Department, as well as the National Parks and Recreation Associ Association uh, regarding the inability for common sanitization or daily sanitization of playground equipment that was, um, you know, frequently highly touched by, you know, kids and families. Um, and so in light of that, as well as the, the large gatherings that you would see, you know, on a sports field, um, out of caution for those two issues, that's where that decision stemmed from. Um, and then one other note on the farmer's market, they are planning to host their uh, events yet this month. Um, farmers market because they provide essential uh, food and other types of services that are carved out in the executive order. They are permitted. There are farmers markets that are uh, operating or getting ready to operate throughout the state. Um, I have been uh, reading and following along with their plans. They've got a social distancing plan. Um, they've got, I think, provisions for like one way in, one way out through the farmers market. Um, I think that board has taken this, you know, very seriously to, you know, follow the rules just like a grocery store would or anywhere else that you would, you know, currently be allowed to go in public. They also have the benefit of being outside. Um, and so I know that that is in their plans right now. As far as uh, the the discussion on equipment at the play, playgrounds, um, you know, I don't know what we would need to do to amend the agenda, but I do think a motion would be helpful just so council is on record. Okay. Um, all right. Well then I guess I'm looking for a motion then to remove the uh, snow fence and any other barricades that have been placed in, throughout our park system and uh, have those reopened by DPW. I have a question first. 
Okay. This is Noah. Um, what are we doing to post or put signage up to practice safe distancing? Do we have anything posted? Because if we take this down, uh, we should have some acknowledgement of saying, hey, you know, practice this. And is I, there think, any, I think is we there... did have that up actually, though, before, prior to, didn't we, Corey? Yes. Uh, essentially, what we would do is change the current signage um, and put in something about maintaining a social distance um, and just encourage people to, you know, wash their hands yep. after playing. And, and, and adhere to the CDC recommendations. Yep. Right. One okay. other note. Uh, so in the parks, we did shut down the public restrooms, uh, again, out of concern for our inability to get in there with any regular frequency um, to clean those during this period of time. And so uh, there's been discussion amongst the city managers group. Every city is going through this and trying to figure out how to deal with these things, especially as the summer seasons open up. Um, and so as part of our reopening process for, for city facilities, we had planned to include um, our plans for the, the restrooms. And so I'd say at this very juncture, I'm not prepared to say how we would handle, you know, cleaning those with any regularity um, you know, I do see that as, as a slightly different issue than the, the equipment because you're in an enclosed area where certainly you have areas that people are touching. Um, so it would be my recommendation to keep the restrooms out of that motion at this juncture and, uh, you know, give us some time to figure out exactly how, um, you know, we can, we can attempt to keep those as sanitized as possible. Uh, that's my two cents on that. I, I would agree with that, Corey. Um, until you're ready to phase those in, I would not recommend um, opening those facilities. Um, I'm, a, I'm in agreement with that. Mayor Gilroy, Jeff Rowland, and Dan Rines both have their hands up. Okay, um, go ahead, Jeff. All right, thanks, Sammy. So do, do we know, Corey, how many cases there are in Williamston? Because when I check out the Ingham County uh, Health Department's website, the 48895 has zero cases. Is that what you're showing as well? I have not looked today um, by certainly any means. So I would trust the Ingham County's guidance on that. Okay. And is there a way that on the bathroom that we can just put a sign up that says use at your own risk, but please uh, adhere to all CDC recommendations just like we do on the playgrounds I, I don't know why the bathroom would be any more dangerous than the slide we we either buy into the fact that people are making responsible judgments or they're not i don't know why the bathroom would be any more dangerous than the uh actual playground so i think if we're opening it we open it all and it just has its normal cleaning schedule i wouldn't think we'd need to clean it any more than we have in the past would you We can certainly do that if that's council's pleasure with the signage, the additional signage. I'm gonna go ahead and jump to Dan for his question. Um, mine was on the on the bathroom as well. With the opening of, of the play structures and whatnot, to me, opening the bathroom allows people an opportunity to wash their hands when they're done at the at the park to clear off yep. whatever germs they've picked up. I feel like with our DPW staff having to clean it, we can provide them with, with gloves to be able to use while they're cleaning it to hopefully be able to clean it safely without uh, that they can you know take off when they're done and be able to clean themselves up afterwards. So hopefully do that safely. But I feel like opening the bathroom up gives mm -hmm. people access to some soap and water to clean themselves up. Thank you, Dan. All right, well, with, with those two comments and uh, with Noah's uh, question, um, does anybody else have a question for Corey on what it would take for DPW to move that forward? I, I guess I would just ask, yes, Corey, would, would it be an issue to open the bathrooms? Like, is there anything that's going to prevent us from doing that from your end, logistically or operationally? Other than unlocking the doors right. and I supplying them with, with, yeah. uh, I know toilet paper is a premium, but 
Right, right. <laughs> At this point, I don't think so. I would just ask, you know, give us a couple days. Uh, yeah. To get it all yep. the signage ready. Um, Corey, would you be able to just update us via email? Because I know that you're going to have to talk with your with staff and everything. But is this something that hopefully we could have bathrooms open on Sunday when farmers market is open, at least by that point? Because there will be a, a, a bigger uh, population down at McCormick Park. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, then um, I am then looking for that uh, motion. I know Noah started off with a question, but I'm looking for a motion then to give Corey the approval to move ahead with DPW in um, taking barricades down at our parks and also putting a plan together for uh, the reopening of restrooms, so a cleaning schedule um, and, and the appropriate signage in the parks and at the uh, restrooms. I will make a motion to uh, reopen our parks by removing any barriers that are currently placed and installing CDC recommended uh, recommendation uh, based signage and including the bathrooms in the opening. Thank you. Second, Rhines. Thank you. Barb, will you call the roll for this, please? Rhines. Yes. Gilroy. Yes. Roland. Yes. Smith. Yes. Bellinger. Yes. Weiss. No. All right. Thank you, members. I appreciate that. Um, that's all very good discussion points. And I'm sure as this continues to move forward and we get more information that comes out from the governor's office and anything, I know Tim's um, office, uh, we get regular emails, at least I'm, I'm seeing them. So I appreciate, you know, keeping us informed um, as you do, but certainly if there's anything else that comes up that requires discussion, please let Corey or Holly know so that we can make sure that we include it on our, our next agenda. Moving along, uh, we did receive, yes. Uh, we need to go back up to accounts payable. It looks like the very first- Yes, Holly. The very oh, I, did, I didn't give a total. Not approved. The Ingham County Treasurer 12A. Yeah, I made that part of the first motion. Is it part of the motion? Yeah, mm -hmm. when I, the first, I made the first motion to pay uh, check 12A, uh, dated yeah, 430, 2020. And then I jumped into the uh, quotation okay. of 73125, dated yeah. 416. But I don't think I gave a total of the $208,642.45. I don't think I gave that total okay. in there. All right. Okay. As long as it's covered, we're good then. Listing off the check numbers. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Hallie. Um, Okay, so moving along, we did receive correspondence with the award of the LEAP grant to the city of Williamston. Holly, thank you, and thank you to the Art Council. Uh, so much for working so dill to, and, and you can keep us updated on the progress of that. And for those of you that may not know, but it, it's a mural that will be on the south side of the uh, Bistro building, correct? At the corner of Middle and uh, Putnam. Correct. Yep. Something to welcome welcome people into the town. I'm I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait to see what what uh, the what it looks like. Uh, department head reports. We did have Corey's report that he included. Did anybody have any questions or Corey's or anything you would like to add additionally? Yeah, I'll just take one minute uh, to comment on that southeast quadrant of town. So in the last going on four years now you know we've completed the complete reconstruction of middle street uh, through the intersection at putnam we are days away from completing the parking lot resurfacing reorientation project that's behind uh, the former red cedar grill ellie's the bistro the hardware um, and then with this art grant you know we've got a, a neat public art project that's coming and so uh, when you really take a step back and look at all the changes that have happened just in, in that quadrant uh, much of it with grant funds or uh, participation with the DDA. I just think it's it's been a really positive thing. And uh, if you haven't driven by the lot, uh, if you take a drive maybe on Friday, you should see the final layer of asphalt 
uh, completed as well as the striping and all the fencing is now up. Um, so it's looking really, really sharp back there. And I think we'll be a, a positive once the rest of the businesses in, in that quadrant are able to open back up to the public. So just uh, kudos to everybody that's worked hard over the last four years to uh, spruce up that area of town. And we look forward to getting that parking lot project done and opened. Great. Thank you, Corey. Any questions for Corey? All right. I'll move along. Uh, Chief, you're up. Anything additionally to add? Nothing more to add. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. All right. I know that we haven't had any of our uh, other regularly scheduled uh, city meetings, so I will move along. Um, I don't think we had any audience join us. Um, I will move along then to council member comments, and I'm going to go by who I see on my screen, so I'll start with Noah. Uh, no comments this evening. Thank you. All right. Dan? Um, I'd like to like to commend some of the uh, the business owners I've seen in town and just how the ingenious ways I've seen some able to uh, to keep some income coming into their shops like Limner Press going from a print shop to making masks and selling those and um, 141 design a lot of the ingenuity that uh, that's happening downtown to try and keep some income coming into their businesses. I think that's great. Um, I hope that uh, that soon more of our businesses can can start to see that. Uh, I I really I really feel for 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 our businesses down there. The the fact that a lot of the large chains can open up and have hundreds of folks in their in their businesses at a time, but our in some of our antique stores and small retail businesses can't have one or two at a time um, it is unfortunate and I hope we can see that change. Thank you, Dan. Oh, yeah. uh, Mr. Weiss, you in my, yes. Um, Monica Schaefer has joined us as an audience member during the meeting. So we do need to go back to audience participation at some point. All right. I will go ahead and just jump back right now. Monica, thank you for joining us. There we go. Yes. Hi. Well, thanks for having me. I finally figured out how to get on. Okay, sure. So um, we're, we've almost concluded the agenda. So I will go ahead and jump uh, into audience participation for you. Um, did you have anything you wanted to share with council? No, no, I'm just listening and um, just, just listening, just curiosity and want to be, you know, part of the community. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, I'm going to go back to uh, council member comments, and that was uh, Jeff in my top left screen. Weiss? I have nothing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Gene Smith, you're in my bottom corner. Um, just a, a big thank you to Tim to, for, for providing such a comprehensive review. Uh, I know we kind of asked for it last minute. Um, but you did a great job uh, giving us um, a lot to chew on there. Um, I, I think any action that we did take as a council uh, to Chief Young's point, we need to ensure that we uh, retain officer discretion um, for a myriad of reasons. Um, but I, I, I personally would be uh, interested in exploring uh, the other avenues further. Um, but I appreciate the uh, council's time tonight. And that's all. All right. Thanks, Jean. Uh, let's see. Jeff Rowland. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, just to echo uh, Jean's comments there, uh, super huge thanks to Tim. Um, you know, it, it's it's tough getting a, a local source of truth to our surrounding communities and what's going on there. So uh, definitely huge thanks for that, just to know what's going on um, around us and what actions other uh, municipalities are taking from a legal standpoint and, and just even for us as a council to fully understand our authority, I think is huge in these moments. So we don't overstep that. So um, thanks again on that one. And uh, yeah, that's all I have. Thanks, Tammy. Thank you. Um, I'll just echo uh, the sentiments of, of everybody from council. I think, you know, we're, we're all on the same page that we want our businesses to thrive and we want to see them reopen, but we certainly don't want them to do it at any risk 
or any further risk to their livelihoods, I would I would love to be able to say, you know, Williamson's completely open, but I don't want anybody to put themselves in any peril unless they're willing to take it on like the like the barber in Owasso. And I applaud him for for being uh, bold enough to do that. Um, and I also look to Chief um, for his guidance and and what he knows his officers are capable of, and and having letting them have that um, discretion. So I appreciate that. I want to say thank you to the entire city staff, um, you know, for continuing to keep the ship upright and keep us moving forward and doing business as normal as possible. Um, and even right down to our DPW staff, I've seen them out doing branch cleanup. Um, they're, you know, appropriately socially distancing. Um, so I extend my thanks to, to all of our city staff um, for everything they're doing every day in this situation. Thank you, Tim, for bringing us such good information. And um, and that's always, you know, that's your expertise area. And, and that's why we're lucky to have you. So I appreciate that. Um, if there are no further comments, I will go ahead and call to adjourn this meeting at 7.55. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Thanks all. Thanks. Thank you.